Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Royal, are you there? Yes, Dr. Guluk. Yes, I'm here. Yes, so Mr. Royal, uh, can you help us uh, make the video recording for this seminar so that we can upload later on to our YouTube channel? Yeah, on the record. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I will, yeah, thank you. Um, so good morning, everyone. So welcome to today's web seminar 2022 series. Uh, before we start uh, the event, I would like to uh, give a couple of remarks. Uh, first of all, this event uh, is being recorded, but at the same time, it will be also be broadcasted live on uh, Facebook uh, of our Water Engineering and Management Program. So I would uh, request that uh, everyone, especially the students, please go ahead and share uh, this event on your timeline so that the knowledge being shared here with can reach to a large audience, especially in your professional network. Okay. So, okay. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to start uh, today. Welcome everyone to today's WEM seminar 2022 series. Uh, number three. So let me first start to share my screen and introduce our speaker today. So um, welcoming to today's web seminar, uh, we are inviting Dr. Nakachet Tandam Aramsop uh, from NASA. So uh, Dr. Nakachet is a postdoc associate at the University of Maryland and also a NASA uh, research associate. And uh, coming to today's web seminar, he will be talking, sharing with us his experience on the use of trace data assimilation techniques in water resources applications. So uh, with that, I would like to stop share and give the floor uh, to Dr. Nat. Dr. Nat, please go ahead and share your screen so we can uh, start today's web seminar. Thank you, Dr. Nat. Okay, I'll take over. Uh, do you see the screen? Yes, your screen is uh, visible now. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Okay, so thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Locke, for a very <laughs> wonderful introduction, which is much better than the reality. Um, and also, uh, let me move this one. And also would like to thank uh, Water Engineering and Management Group for inviting me for delivering this uh, talk. Um, also, it's very my honor to uh, receive this invitation from AIT, which uh, basically a very close neighbor uh, when I did my undergrad in uh, Thammasat University. Um, before we start, uh, please allow me a few seconds to introduce myself and I'll jump right into uh, today's talk. Um, my name is Natasha Tangdarong Sap, uh, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Earth System Science Interdisciplinary uh, Center at the University of Maryland. Um, my research has on uh, several aspects of land data simulation uh, and a lot on satellite remote sensing and also machine learning. Uh, and today I'll talk about how we can use some of these techniques for re uh, water resource applications. Um, as you can probably notice from the uh, title that I add a few words to the, uh, the title, uh, actually to include some introduction on what GRACE is. Uh, since I believe that this might be helpful for the audience who never heard about GRACE before. Um, but the overall content is still the same as what you found in the abstract. Okay. So I'll go over the concept of GRACE, uh, which probably uh, many of you might already know that is the gravimetry satellite missions. And the data has been used in uh, hydrology a lot. And I think in some aspect, uh, GRACE data might be also useful in water engineering and management as well. Uh, I will cover the limitation of GRACE, uh, which is also bring us to the second part of the talk where uh, we will use the technique like data simulation to enhance the usage of GRACE data. Uh, and I believe this talk will take, a, uh, take around 35 or 45 minutes, and then we can get into the Q&A session. Uh, first of all, let me introduce the term terrestrial water storage first, or I'll call it TWS. Uh, it reflects the water component on land in any form. 
uh, and normally uh, we define it as the sum of all storage components like soil moisture, uh, groundwater, uh, can be snow and also uh, canopy water as well. Uh, the importance of terrestrial water storage is very clear to us uh, as it the source of drinking water and also help to support activities like agriculture. Um, with some descent physics, uh, the TWS can be approximate to water cycle, uh, like what we learned from our school, uh, where the sun heats up the water. Uh, where the sun heats up the water and water evaporates to the atmosphere. And once it's condensed, uh, uh, it precipitates back to the earth's surface in the form of uh, rain or snow. Uh, with this uh, concept, uh, reasonable, accurate uh, TWS can be predicted uh, if there's no disturbance on this cycle. Uh, however, in, re in reality, the, the earth system is very complex. Uh, together with human activity like uh, water, groundwater pumping or irrigation, uh, it becomes very difficult to obtain uh, an accurate water storage from this concept. Uh, so how do we measure water storage then? Um, the most accurate approach is to collect the sample from the field. Um, this can be simple as uh, using a meter tape to uh, measure the water table in the groundwater well. Or in case of soil moisture, we can use a tool like uh, water content refractometer meter to get the soil moisture uh, sample at some certain depth. And in case of stream flow that probably most of you are familiar with, we can use flow probe or wetting rod to measure the water depth. And then we can use that to derive discharge or water flow later. Um, oops, let me just turn off this. And these techniques are very really robust for a point measurement. Uh, but uh, the measurements cannot reflect uh, reliable information for a large scale uh, or for something like a kilometer away from the sampling point. Uh, to demonstrate this, I'll show this picture, which is from the International Soil Moisture Network. Uh, and this picture shows how many stations that we have available data in the past 10 years, uh, which apparently not so many. Uh, this is particular over the Asian regions that uh, technically is uh, nearly empty space. Uh, this gives us some idea how fast the measurement, uh, ground measurements can be. Uh, and for this reason, um, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the reason why, why, why we have this sparse network is uh, uh, basically due to the factors like uh, high maintenance costs, uh, difficult to operate, or in some remote areas are not even accessible. Um, let's look at the national level. Um, this slide shows a map based archive from the uh, Thailand's groundwater department, uh, which reflects the issue that I just described. Um, simply ground coverage is very, very limited and several stations have only a few data points available in time series. Um, so one possible way to get the complete picture of large scale uh, water storage is through satellite observations. And now we have a good reason to get into our topic today. Uh, this picture provides some rough idea about the number of current and future satellites uh, that we can use to observe variables uh, that is related to water. Um, and as you might know that there are actually a lot more satellite missions uh, when we include other international missions like uh, the network from uh, European side or other commercial satellites. Uh, so uh, there are basically a lot of satellites for us to work with. Um, so if there are already so many satellites, why, why do we need gravimetry satellites for uh, the applications like water, uh, water resource? Uh, to answer this question, I, uh, we need to look at some of the available satellites uh, and what their limitations are. Uh, one of the well-known uh, satellite observation is the imagery uh, from the sensor like MODIS. Um, the, uh, this one. So the sensor measures the electromagnetic magnetic, uh, radiation from the Earth's surface. And since different objects uh, emit or reflect different uh, electromagnetic magnetic wave, so uh, by directly analyze uh, re reflectance data or uh, mostly we do uh, the combine, uh, we do the combination. 
so we can figure it out uh, that the object uh, vegetation, water, uh, fire, or, or even snow. Um, well known mission likes map uh, can be used to measure the surface soil moisture. Uh, and a very advanced system like uh, ISAT2 uh, can be used to observe the elevation or water height. Um, although these mission, uh, these three missions are very unique, uh, they have one thing in common, uh, and you might notice the word surface. So uh, the measurements uh, only reflect the surface layers, uh, but they cannot provide us information of the deeper layer or complete uh, picture of terrestrial water storage. Um, technically, it's, a, it's a very difficult or even impossible to decide a passive or active sensor that measure all the way through the whole water column. So we use gravimetry technique to indirectly measure that. Uh, this brings us to the concept of using uh, satellite gravimetry to measure the Earth uh, total water storage. So briefly, uh, the basic idea is that uh, any mass at the Earth's surface will induce the change of Earth gravity. And if we can measure that gravity change, so we might know the amount of water change at that particular time. Okay, so let, let me simplify the problem using our high school Newton's law of gravitation. Uh, the law states that uh, any two masses will attract each other and the force acting between them is the function of uh, the product between two masses and the distance between them. Uh, so with this concept, uh, it's not difficult to see that if we assume um, M1 uh, as the mass of the total water storage, uh, uh, that can be changed over time, uh, like water storage on Earth. And somehow we can decide M2, uh, which is the satellite uh, with the known mass, and we can, uh, and we also have a sensor that measure the force between them and also the distance between them as well. So we can simply derive M1 from this equation. Um, and of course, this is very simplified. Uh, in reality, it's more complicated than this, but, but you get the idea. So the satellite gravimetry that uh, we will talking about today is the uh, gravity recovery and climate experiment or GRACE and GRACE follow on, uh, which is a successor mission that launched uh, after GRACE terminated a few years ago. Uh, GRACE and GRACE follow on are the joint satellite mission between NASA and German Space Agency. Um, both missions have a similar design uh, with uh, GRACE follow on equipped with, uh, with the more modern technologies. Uh, and, and in this talk, I'll call both, of, uh, mission, uh, I'll call both missions uh, GRACE. Um, in brief, uh, GRACE is a twin satellite placing at 200 kilometers apart. Yep. Uh, and they fly in the same orbit of around 450 kilometers above surf, uh, the Earth's surface. Uh, two satellites are equipped with multiple state of the art sensors. And the key instrument is the K band ranging system. If you can see that there's a microwave uh, ranging system here. Uh, which is uh, this one is used to measure the range of uh, between two satellites at micrometer accuracy. And in case of GRACE follow on, the accuracy goes up to a nanometer. And this is the accuracy or sensitivity that we need in order to produce or calculate gravity solutions we are using today. Um, to put this accuracy into perspective, uh, let's think about um, two vehicles. Uh, driving at 200 kilometers apart. And the tailing cars or vehicle needs to shoot some light beam to hit the, uh, the leading vehicle. Uh, and the target on the leading vehicle is uh, 70 times smaller than the human hair. And they have to keep doing this for 15 years. So it's very impressive uh, satellite missions. Uh, this slide shows how GRACE measure the mass. Uh, uh, the subplot A. Uh, the subplot A shows uh, the business as usual case. Um, here there is no mass change occurs on the Earth's surface. So the distance between uh, two satellites remain the same. Uh, in B, 
uh, when the satellite approaches the mass, the uh, leading satellite will uh, accelerate toward the mass. Uh, this is due to the gravitational pull from the mass. And this caused the uh, distance between two satellites to increase. Uh, in C, uh, when the second satellite across the mass, uh, it also accelerates. And this also changed uh, the range between two, two satellites. And in D, uh, when both satellites pass the mass, so everything uh, come back to normal. So, so this range variation and other necessary observations are passed through a bunch of processing uh, steps. Um, and they are used to derive uh, this particular mass. So by doing this globally, so GRACE can provide information of uh, global uh, water survey change over time. So every month, uh, GRACE will release a map like this, so which uh, represent the terrestrial water survey change. Uh, this figure shows some example of TWS uh, maps from recent month, uh, I believe it's 2019 and 2020. Uh, the red tones we see here uh, with some negative values uh, indicates the losing water and the blue tones in, uh, reflects the, the gaining water. Um, and this variation, uh, note that this variation is actually respect to the certain mean level. Uh, which normally we use TDMGS in the past 20, uh, 15 years. And using this information, we can analyze the hydrology or geographical activities at uh, one specific, uh, one particular time. Uh, for instance, um, in June 2019, uh, there is a gaining water over, uh, let's see, Amazon River Basin. Uh, and also uh, uh, Eastern China, uh, which might be caused by seasonal rainfall. And as you can notice that uh, India is losing water, which might be something related to irrigation or simply less rainfall in that month. And with almost 20 years of data, we can investigate the trend of water storage change uh, in the past decades. Uh, this map highlights the, the advantage of using GRACE in applications like uh, groundwater monitoring. Uh, for example, uh, groundwater depletion in California, uh, depletion, also depletion in uh, uh, Northeast China, and particularly in over India. Uh, and also can be used to detect the, the, the ice, uh, ice sheet loss, like in Antarctica or Greenland. And also other areas that you can see, uh, most of them are either flood or drought signals. And it can be even be used to detect the reservoir feeling uh, signature as well. Um, but I need to emphasize here that GRACE observation only observe the total mass change, uh, but it cannot distinguish the source. Uh, I'll discuss this in the next slide uh, in a little bit more details. Um, so uh, basically hydrology and uh, geophysical knowledge are very important for when we interpret great signals. Um, um, and before we move uh, to the next slide, I would like uh, you to look at this map closely and you might, uh, you might uh, see that basically there is no, not much analysis in Southeast Asian region. So basically the, the analysis somehow, you know, uh, just neglect these uh, areas. So that means uh, there are a lot of rooms to, for potential research in these areas. Um, so now we can obtain the large scale terrestrial water storage observations that we want. Uh, so what is the problems? Uh, like I mentioned in the last slide that uh, Grace sends the change of water storage of the entire column, uh, but it does not know what the source of the mass is, either it's from soil or groundwater or snow. So one of the issue here is that uh, when we have a great measurement, uh, we cannot directly separate them into individual components, uh, like water in soil, aquifer, or in the lake. 
And these components are of interest uh, in water resource community. Uh, the user are not really interested in getting the total water column. So unless we can disaggregate this uh, TWS into different components, uh, Quest data doesn't seem as attractive as it sounds. Uh, another challenge is that uh, is the cost resolution of grids. Um, what looks like a bathroom wall in this picture is the grid mass con solution, uh, which has a resolution of around 300 kilometer. Um, so there might only be a single pixel in some river catchment for us to work with. And this limitation restricts grid uh, application in uh, to a very large rural basin. And again, this is not very useful for many local studies that requires much higher spatial resolution like a few kilometers. So this brings us to the second part of the talk uh, on how we can maximize the potential use of GRACE data. And the technique we'll, uh, I will cover today is uh, data assimilation or I'll call it DA sometimes. Um, and the technique can be applied to optimize the strength of observation and the model. And, and this is to improve the water storage estimates. And the beauty of this technique is that it can be applied to any satellite data and any model, uh, not a regress. Um, uh, but in this talk, I will only focus on quest, uh, data simulation. Uh, from the observation perspective, uh, data simulation can be thought as the way to improve uh, observation resolution. Uh, let's say we can use the technique to downscale a cost scale satellite resolution, uh, uh, cost res uh, sorry, cost satellite resolution to a much finer uh, resolution that we can obtain from the model. Um, and on the other hand, uh, uh, on the modeling perspective, uh, the data simulation can be thought as the approach to improve the accuracy of the model simulation. Uh, so the state estimates can be brought to uh, close to satellite observation. Let's see about uh, more into the details. Um, in case of GRACE data simulation, let me uh, bring up this example. So, Again, this is a great uh, observation which has a limited resolution and only provide a single integrated water column. Alternatively, we can obtain uh, TWS information from the model. Uh, and with a decent design, uh, the model can be used to simulate TWS at a very high uh, spatial and temporal resolution, let's say uh, every one kilometer or an every day. And also the individual uh, water storage components can be estimated instead of getting dolly the integrated one from uh, like what we have from Chris. Um, the drawback of the model is the reliability of the result. Uh, this is due to the uncertainty in model inputs like forcing data, uh, model parameters or model physics. Um, and with this, uh, model simulation is often inaccurate, especially when the model is not calibrated or the simulation has been performed for quite a while. And the time series in this figure shows example of uh, daily terrestrial water storage estimates from the model simulation. Uh, and what you see in the solid line is the estimated value and the envelope uh, represent the model errors. So this shows that the model error is growing with the length of simulation, or in other words, uh, the model results usually becomes less and less reliable over time. And this initiated the idea of optimizing information from observation and the model statistically uh, to bring up the strength of both model and uh, observations. And this flow diagram uh, illustrates how it works. Um, two sources of information are needed uh, in this optimization. Uh, one from observation, which is close to the truth, uh, but often has a very limited resolution. Uh, the second is from model results, 
uh, which provide us very fine resolution, but is in, uh, unfortunately often inaccurate. Um, by combining these two informations, uh, taking into account their relative errors, uh, we can expect the state estimates to be as accurate as observation and have a resolution as fine as the model. Uh, there are several approaches to perform this optimization or combination, and I'll focus on data assimilation here, uh, which in my opinion is the most robust approach. Um, there are many types of data assimilation, but one of the most common use in hydrology is Ensemble Command Filter, or ENKF. And this diagram shows how data assimilation process works. Um, so in the first step, the model uh, initial states and inputs like uh, forcing data or and model parameters are perturbed with uh, their errors. And this results in multiple realization uh, and we can normally call them ensemble members. As you can see, there are zero realization here. Uh, and these ensemble members are propagated in time. So as shown in the green color here. And this results in the ensemble model states that can be used to build up the model uh, error distribution. Now, uh, when the observation is available, so you can see from the letter Y here with the purple color, um, we update the model state with respect to the relative errors between model and observation. Uh, after this upgrade, we have a new set of initial state in red. Um, then the model simulation continues uh, by using this update value as initial state. Uh, and now you might see that the model propagation is actually started from this uh, red dot uh, and not started from the green dot, which is the model estimate anymore. Uh, and this process repeats until we complete the simulation. Um, so one remark here is that uh, ensemble common filter is more suitable for the instantaneous uh, observation, uh, which means that the model and observation time should be consist uh, should be consistent uh, when the at the uh, at the time we perform the update. Uh, for a better understanding, let me illustrate how the data simulation process works step by step using uh, the, this uh, small animation. Uh, assume that uh, we have an initial state uh, at, and also its error at time zero, uh, T zero, and we perform model propagation and we obtain the uh, initial state at time T one. Uh, let's assume that we do nothing with the process. Uh, let's say we uh, have no observation available so we applied, uh, we continue doing uh, model propagation to the next some step, some step, sorry, and so on. So we can see that the model error is getting larger and larger. Uh, and also our uh, hydrology variables uh, can be estimated. Um, a very large error like this tells us that the result is not really reliable. But now let's apply data simulation to uh, the simulation. Uh, again, we have an initial state at the time t0, and we propagate them into the next time steps. Uh, instead of continuing the propagation, uh, we now have observation uh, at step t1. Uh, and also note that the observation also has errors. Uh, now we compute the state update and receive a new uh, uh, initial state in blue. Then we use this new uh, state for the next uh, model propagation and receive uh, the result at time step T2. And then we have another observation available. Uh, let's see. Uh, notice that this time the observation error is smaller than model errors. So the update uh, moves toward observation. And then the model propagation uh, is continued uh, using this update initial state. And then we arrive at uh, uh, the epoch T3, uh, where we have another observation, but now the observation error is much larger than the model error. So, so once we do the updates, uh, the state uh, remain closer to the model since the observation is not reliable. So by comparing this with the model state without data assimilation that we see in the last slide, uh, we have a new estimate that is closer to the observations. 
Uh, this like uh, basically uh, explains the time that we need to perform that assimilation might be an issue in, in practice. Uh, let me start with a very simple example. Uh, let's say our problem only involves uh, four grid cells, uh, four time steps, and say we have 100 uh, samples or ensemble. Um, uh, and let's uh, assume that the model can be uh, run at the grid by grid uh, basis. And also let's assume that the process uh, of one time step will take 10 milliseconds in this case. So after doing this simple math, math uh, just do the simple math on this uh, simulation, we basically arrive at 16 seconds uh, that we need to complete this entire simulation. And this short simulation time is what we need uh, since we might need to rerun this by 100 or 1000 times to get the optimal setting for the problem. Uh, but you know that in practice, uh, our problem might have much larger dimension, like, like let's say we have a hundred, uh, 10,000 grid cells and we need to run it daily for 20 years. And let's keep the sample uh, 100, our 100 sample uh, as the previous one. So let's do the simple math on this. We arrive at uh, three months. So in order to finish this one, we need three months. Um, so this might not look large, but imagine that we need, uh, we have a hundred cases to test. So uh, totally we would need 25 years to finish these simple uh, simulations. So, um, so this example uh, simply highlights that we basically need uh, parallel computing for data simulation study. So several processes can be executed simultaneously. And assuming that we rewrite our model codes using uh, the tools like Fortran MPI or Python multiprocessor, and say we have a hundred core CPU. So uh, then we solve the same problem. So we would need basically uh, around less than one day to finish the same problem. Um, Things become more complicated in case of graph data simulation. Uh, this is due to that the resolution of the model uh, and observation are in very inconsistent. Uh, and we uh, cannot upgrade, uh, update the model uh, in a grid by grid scale uh, that I described uh, before. Um, um, let's see. So this figure uh, basically shows the difference between model and observation grid size uh, that we might encounter. Uh, if we look at the green zoom in inset here, oops. So we could see that the model grid size, uh, which I show them in red dot here, uh, is multiple times smaller than the grid grid size. Uh, uh, and for this uh, particular uh, figure, the model has five kilometer resolution. So there's almost 4,000 model grid cells in one uh, observation pixels. And in this case, uh, multiple grid cells need to be updated together by taking into account the uh, special correlation errors between them. And this makes the dimension of the problem much larger than other DA cases. Uh, temporal inconsistency, inconsistency also pose another complication in grid data assimilation. Um, this is because Quest provides monthly mean value, uh, while the model's time step is usually hourly or daily. Um, so to do this more correctly, we need uh, to use uh, so-called three-dimensional uh, in simple karma smoother uh, to account for the spatial and temporal inconsistency. Uh, I'll skip the details here to save some time, but uh, briefly, uh, we need to rerun, uh, we need to run the mo uh, model simulation twice. So the first one is basically to collect the monthly average state variable uh, that is consistent with the grace temporal resolution. Uh, and then we rerun the model again and distribute this update across the month. Um, let me skip this one. So this basically shows uh, one uh, grace, possible grace data simulation scheme that we can use. Um, so let's uh, see some example of the results. So this slide shows the benefit of optimizing information between uh, observation and the model. Uh, the left figures um, here, uh, 
uh, shows the great observation that has caused resolution of about uh, 300 kilometers. And in the right figure uh, is the result after uh, the optimization applied. Uh, and in this case, the improved results show much higher spatial res uh, uh, resolution. Um, yep, higher spatial resolution than the model. Uh, and this is by around, I believe is 10,000 times, uh, 100,000 times, because it's one kilometer and fit 300, right? Uh, so compared to the use of observation alone, uh, the improved TWS could be more useful for local studies that need much higher spatial details. So I recently investigated uh, the benefit of great data simulation in Thailand. Uh, and this result was uh, presented last month in DHA 2022 uh, conference. Uh, the experiment was uh, conducted in the Northern part of Pin River Basin. Uh, and this is because uh, is the area that I can find is to groundwater measurement to validate the result. And in this slide, uh, the correlation improvement of uh, groundwater is shown on the right here, uh, where the red color shows that great data assimilation techniques improve results, and the blue is the opposite. So I found quite a convincing result uh, that great data assimilation helps to improve the correlation over this test area by around 0.3, uh, which is uh, significant. Uh, given that the model groundwater estimate in this area is already very accurate. And the future plan is to extend this uh, study to the entire country. And we may need some help to, uh, for someone to get the institute data for validation uh, when the time comes. So uh, what we normally found uh, from GRACE data simulation study is that GRACE uh, improves groundwater storage the most. Uh, but the technique usually shows negligible impact on surface components like uh, soil moisture or evapotranspiration. Uh, this might be due to two reasons. Uh, uh, the first reason is that GRACE is dominated by annual or interannual signals, uh, which is consistent with the groundwater variation. And uh, the reason number two is that uh, groundwater store is usually larger than other stores. And it usually has higher uncertainty than uh, other store as well uh, due to its size. Uh, so uh, data simulation normally distribute most of the update to the groundwater. Um, so we learned that uh, great data simulation uh, will not benefit much uh, to the surface uh, components like soil moisture, uh, evapotranspiration uh, or even stream flow. Um, so uh, how do we, so this somehow initiated the idea of using more than one satellite uh, data in uh, data simulation process. And in that case, we will call it uh, multivariate data simulation. So in contrast to univariate the, uh, data simulation like grace data simulation or other type like uh, soil moisture data simulation, uh, the multivariate data simulation can use uh, multiple satellites to update the model states at the same time. So the observation can be vegetation state from uh, MODIS, uh, soil moisture from, let's say, the mission like uh, small source map and TWS from GRACE. Um, the process and implementation is going to be uh, is going to be more complicated than using only one observation. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, it's worth doing because multiple model states estimates can be improved simultaneously. Uh, and a good example for this multivariate data simulation system is the uh, NASA uh, National Climate Assessment Land Data Simulation System or NCLDAS. Uh, which is currently assimilates more than 10 satellite data into the model. Uh, and that is to improve uh, water storage and flux estimates. Uh, and if anyone interests, uh, we can have a look in more details uh, about this advanced system in the future seminar. So I think I used the time uh, up to 40 minutes. 
So let, let, let me end this uh, presentation with some uh, take home messages. Um, so uh, we learned that Grace can be used uh, for several water resource applications and also a long record of Grace data is quite suitable for reanalysis studies. Um, however, uh, we need to be aware that uh, Grace resolution is quite coarse uh, and the data cannot be directly separated into individual uh, water storage component like soil or uh, water storage in lake. Um, so the model is another solution to get uh, water storage information, uh, but the accuracy is uh, often not as good as the observation. And because of that, we use that as simulation technique to blend or uh, optimize these two source of information. And finally, we learned that uh, since uh, uh, univariate data simulation often improve only one variable, so uh, we may need to use uh, so-called multivariate data simulation to improve multiple uh, state variables at the same time. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to end my talk here. And uh, I again would like to uh, thank Water Engineering and Management Group again for this uh, invitation. And I can take the question if any. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nat, uh, for providing a very insightful and full of useful information uh, about GRACE and its applications in water resources, uh, sciences, and engineering. I mean, it's a very nice coincidence because yesterday one of our students just had her uh, progress examinations and then she's also uh, taking the same approach to estimate uh, terrestrial and groundwater storage in Southeast Asia. And hopefully her work will contribute to the knowledge gap that we talked about in Southeast Asia that not, not so many works uh, have been conducted. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nat. So with that, I would like to open the floors for Q&A. Uh, so for those of you who have questions, uh, please uh, turn on your video, unmute yourself and ask questions directly to Dr. Nat. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. Nat, you may want to uh, uh, turn your screen back okay, to the sure. title one so that everyone can. Uh, oh, you need me to still sharing? Yeah, uh, maybe the title slide, you know, just to- oh, Okay, uh, let me go back to that. I think yeah, it does yeah. it. Yes, uh, I saw one really hand good. raised already. Uh, may I invite- oh, Okay, uh, yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, please, may I invite uh, Ms. Surabi? Thank you, please go ahead and introduce yourself and ask questions to Dr. Nat. Thank you, Dr. Naka. Thank you, Dr. Nat. It was very insightful uh, talk for me because uh, I just, I'm also working on the same topic and I, I just had my progress examination that Dr. Love was talking about. <laughs> And uh, I, I wanted to ask you a few questions. The first one is, uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, the course resolution of uh, terrestrial water stories anomaly from GRACE. So uh, uh, you suggested the Kalman filter approach, uh, but uh, is there uh, a simpler way, like uh, is, uh, does bilinear interpolation fill certain gaps in uh, like reducing the course resolution or is there uh, uh, any other way like uh, similar to bilinear interpolation or is this uh, bilinear interpolation a good way to just downscale uh, the data, race data? That is one question. And uh, uh, the other one is uh, uh, you, you also mentioned uh, that you presented in the TAC conference about uh, groundwater uh, in the Chiang Mai region. So I wanted to ask you how uh, did you compare the uh, groundwater from observed uh, stations to that obtained from GRACE? Did you like uh, uh, upscale the point data to grid scale or uh, the basin scale? Or uh, did you use the pixel to point approach to uh, downscale grid to point and then compared? So that's the question I wanted to ask you. Okay. So uh, let me answer the first question uh, that uh, what if we do, uh, can we interpret GRACE data to model grid cells uh, to make life much easier, let's say. Um, yes, we can do that. Uh, and many software do that, uh, like uh, Lens Information System also do that as well. So you can simply uh, uh, shop GRACE uh, cost resolution into the file resolution. And also, if you want to interpolate them, either special domain or temporal domain, you can do that as well, as long as it works. Uh, however, uh, in terms of um, 
uh, if you want to do it correctly, uh, that is not the way. So basically, uh, the thing about this quest provides us uh, three by three degree by three degree crystals. And basically that is the average of everything in that three by three grid cells. So we cannot say that uh, the point measurement, like let's say five kilometers in that uh, three by three grid cells is the same everywhere, right? So by interpolation, you, you do that. So you somehow inject some uh, additional errors into your uh, uh, data simulation already. Uh, however, yeah, so, so I came up with this, uh, if, uh, just, just a second, I, I just answer you this one. So if you want to do that interpolation, I believe you can do that, but don't forget to account for the interpolation errors as well. So in that case, you cannot take grace errors, but you have to take grace plus interpolation errors as well. So that, that might work. And the second question is the, the, the validate, water validation in, in uh, the study I just showed. I, yes, we, uh, what I did is I assimilate uh, grace data into five kilometers uh, model. And basically uh, for each uh, model pixels, I average everything. Uh, I, let's say we have uh, several, get, uh, several groundwater stations. So I average them all. So just to make the special uh, resolution in, uh, consistent between the two. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nat, for responding to Ms. Surabi. Uh, before we move on to the second question, uh, uh, maybe we have a uh, photo session, uh, Mr. Royal. Uh, can you kindly coordinate our photo session? Thank you. Your photo session. Yeah, please, yes. uh, Dr. Nat, to close, uh, exit first the slide. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So you. should I close it? Should yeah, I yes, uh, start uh, just, sharing the screen? Yes, yes, just and share for a moment for okay. so that we can have okay. a group photo session. Okay, so good morning to everyone. Uh, please turn on your camera. When I say smile and I count three, so I smile. So one, two, and three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Royal. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to come back to the Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Nat, you may want to share your title screen again, and I okay. want to invite the uh, second question from uh, Mr. BJ. Ashakia, please uh, go ahead and ask questions to our presenter. Thank you, Mr. BJ. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Dr. Nat, for your presentations. And it was quite insightful for all of us. So I will. I want to ask two questions regarding uh, the grace and the data that you were interpreting, uh, especially regarding groundwater stories. So I just want to ask, uh, how did you uh, differentiate between shallow groundwater and groundwater in the like groundwater stories? Because when I was working with this grace data, I, I had a like big problem regarding like uh, the differentiation between shallow groundwater and deep groundwater. Because like uh, when we are working in deep groundwater, it gives a big uh, combination of both uh, shallow and deep. So do you have any idea regarding uh, this one, how we can define or uh, the differentiate between these two uh, resources. And also the second one is uh, when you were kind of like uh, converting from the coarse grid to the final, especially to the local cases, have you ever say, like shared uh, the Python data codes in any met like uh, media or not? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, BJ. Um, the first question is the distinguish between uh, uh, shallow groundwater and deep groundwater. Yeah. Um, the thing is that uh, it's tricky to, 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 to do that directly with grace data since uh, the, graft, uh, the gravity signal basically represents the whole columns. So basically it's impossible for you to, to force to even separate uh, one component from the others. So, so basically what we do is that we, we trust the model to do that. So basically uh, we do that through the uh, correlation between those uh, we, we uh, simply that we, we, we do that through the data assimilation and we 
uh, basically we, we use those information to separate this uh, for us. Um, and if you, uh, uh, if you're concerned about the, the accuracy of, of this, basically uh, you might need to look at more than one model. <laughs> basically, this might be the best way. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the, not sure if you heard about NOAA MP, for example, uh, is the NOAA multi-parameterization. Uh, there are several options for the groundwater store. So, so in that case, you may have a look at uh, the variety of, 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 of the model results and, and, and hopefully that you have uh, validation data available as well to, 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 you know, to validate if, if what you thought is correct, right? Um, and the second question is the, about the code. <laughs> uh, yes, I often receive this question. Uh, yeah, every time I submit a paper, I always receive this question. I, um, not currently, I, I would say that. Uh, I'm working on that. So, so, so you, that there might be a course available from, uh, from my side uh, this year. I, I'm trying to uh, produce it in either Python or MATLAB. So, so easier to run for you and, and, and try to provide some example as well for you to, you know, to, to, to gain more understanding on that. Uh, however, if you are in Raj and you are not afraid of Fortran, you can have a, you can have a look at the NASA uh, land information system okay. um, or LIS, if you can type uh, in the Google and search for that. It's an it's a, it's a open source software and you can get that from GitHub. So, so, and you can have a look at the code and that there is a great data simulation already uh, ready for you to use. Okay, thank you very much. But if you can wait, maybe this year or next year, probably yeah. it's from my side. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. BJ uh, and Dr. Nat. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Tun. Uh, uh, please, Dr. Tun, please introduce yourself and ask question. Dr. Nat, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm Tun. I'm a research fellow in WAM program. I'm so working on the ground water field. Uh, so firstly, I would like to thank for your presentation. So I think continue with the question from Surabi and the uh, BJ. I think we have been to the different kind of the, um, the aquifer. So because I think it's, it's the same, like uh, Surabi mentioned about how to validate the ground water level with your estimation. And BJ mentioned about the different distance drive in the shallow and the deep aquifer. So I also have the same concerns. Uh, because like I, I mean, based on your explanation, so it's hard to separate like like a shallow and uh, the deep aquifer. So in your estimation, it should be the I mean, it's a uh, only one storage, right? We we cannot separate by shallow storage and and the deep one. So in this case, uh, how depth? It depends on the location, right? I, I mean, the how depth of the we need to define that's before, right? This is the first question. The depth of the the, the aquifer there, uh, I, I mean, cannot be like a two exactly, but on the average, right? Like a one hundred meter depth or two hundred meter depth. Otherwise, we have some something to compare with the other kind, like a physical model, to combine the the solid of the the the, the aquifer there, right? I just just my first question. Okay, you want me to answer first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll I answer that first. Uh, uh, again, I, 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 I uh, just, yeah, I, I don't like when I keep saying that, that, that you know, grace is the integrated water column and, 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 and it's difficult for you to uh, separate. However, if, if the, let's say any two uh, storage components have different frequency, let's say, so uh, your shell of uh, groundwater might have a higher frequency than the uh, deeper groundwater layer in that, uh, for example. So, so you may have a look at uh, grace data and you compare that, uh, for example, like correlation, let's say, or even you can do Fourier transform to, to get the, the, you try to detect the frequency if uh, uh, grace signal represents uh, which uh, storage layers. So, so, so that, that might be uh, a good way if you really want to uh, disaggregate grace signal directly uh, without DA, I, I would say that if yep, to yep, my knowledge. Yep, yep. Thank you. So, uh, continue with this. So, I, I heard that you have the, some some work on in the Chiang Mai, right? Work on the groundwater storage in the Chiang Mai province. So, 
I, I, I think that's based on the geology or hydrogeology there. So it's more or less like a, the rock aquifer. So have you tried some application, I mean, in the lower basin, like a central plain? Have, have you tried it in, in, the, in your work or only in the, I mean, the rock area, the mountain area? No. Yeah, yeah, so I think- Not yet. That, yeah, yeah, I think so that's the case, like uh, maybe the case of the Surabi in the lower Mekong Delta. So we have, I mean, the very deep aquifer, 300 meter depth, 500 meter depth. And so the shallow aquifer, a lot of clay material. So we, we use some, very, some challenges with the estimation based on the gray data, but maybe we see maybe more application in the mountain area with the rock distribution. So, I mean, the, the aquifer uh, classification, maybe net, net the layer. So there's other thing I would like to, 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 to ask and comment. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Dr. Don, uh, for this. Uh, so coming up next, may I invite uh, Mr. Yagesh also, one of our WAM students. Please, Yagesh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nett. Um, basically, I want to know one suggestion, like uh, as Grace is giving the terrestrial water storage, so uh, due to spatial resolution, can we use uh, the uh, MODIS data plus SMAP data plus ISAC 2 data and some of all the data and can we use uh, instead of Grace to that? Uh, if I understand it correctly, you mean if you want to use, uh, say, satellite soil moisture or altimetry to disaggregate Grace uh, data? Um, um, should be very difficult, I would say, since uh, the, the observation from SMAP or, or ISAT or other uh, altimetry satellites um, are very shallow. So, so basically they might sense only at the top five centimeter of, of, you know, of the soil, while uh, you may have like a two meter depth or even 20 meter depth of uh, aquifer. So, so basically it is going to be very difficult, but, 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 but you can try. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Nett. Uh, it's about time. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Sangam Stratha uh, to have a question comment uh, before we close the session today. Please, Professor Sangam, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Locke. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nett, uh, for accepting our uh, request to make this uh, WEM seminar. I also really enjoyed your uh, presentation. Um, I think this, uh, you know, Grace uh, has a lot of uh, importance uh, in terms of uh, uh, water resources management, especially the groundwater resources management, where uh, we do not have uh, measurements, uh, especially in the developing countries, right? So uh, it has a lot of uh, applications in the water resources management. Uh, I have one question and one comment. Uh, yeah, my question is related to um, what is the possibility of uh, uh, using this uh, GRACE data uh, to identify the uh, groundwater flow direction or groundwater table depletion, um, you know, uh, because uh, it can be applied at a macro scale, right? And if we talk about especially the, the transboundary uh, aquifers, um, it's usually difficult for us to identify the groundwater flow direction, right? Groundwater uh, table depletion because of the extraction on either side of the transboundary basin. So do you see any methodology or any techniques to use this uh, race data set to identify or to examine the groundwater flow direction and uh, groundwater table depletion? So that's uh, uh, one of my questions. Uh, probably you can answer that, and I will move to all the comment. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I don't. So I don't see much uh, studies on grace or grace data simulation on the lateral flow of groundwater. But uh, uh, it might be that uh, basically. Uh, most of the software or most of the users basically uh, assimilate grace uh, at grid by grid scales. So basically they don't account for any correlation between connection between grid cells at all. So, uh, but if, 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 if uh, you're interested in looking at that lateral flow 
uh, and the model is also available as well. So what I would propose to do is that, uh, like what I showed in the slide, that we don't update them at grid by grid scales, but basically you do 3D. So basically include, let's say, uh, treat the data simulation for the whole basins. So in that case, we might be able to get some information of this uh, lateral force. But, but this is to my knowledge, but yeah, I definitely might miss something. Right, right. Yeah, I think uh, probably that's the good approach, right? It's probably not only the GRACE uh, data, probably combination of other models, right. uh, maybe conceptual groundwater models or you know other kind of groundwater model, right? So yeah, um, so probably that's uh, the limitations. Um, yeah, my uh, comment is uh, actually um, uh, in our program, we have been conducting uh, several projects related to uh, groundwater management uh, in Mekong region and also some of the uh, cities uh, outside the Mekong region. Um, so the main objective is to support, you know, evidence-based uh, decision making for several governmental agencies uh, related to uh, groundwater uh, development and management. Uh, so we have a couple of projects ongoing, which is related to uh, groundwater management. Um, and I see that uh, you are also conducting uh, this uh, uh, groundwater related work, especially this application of uh, GRACE and GRACE data uh, for estimation of groundwater storage anomaly and so on, right? And I saw that uh, uh, currently you are doing this uh, um, in, in Ping River Basin in Thailand, right? So um, if possible, you know, we, we also want to collaborate uh, in near future uh, because we have also a lot of data sets, uh, not only from the um, Mekong River Basin, uh, but also outside the Mekong River Basin. So I, I see a lot of the scope of the collaboration between you, your team, and also our team in uh, water engineering and management. So maybe we can discuss after uh, the seminar is over, or uh, if you have time, probably after the seminar is over, we can also discuss uh, for a few minutes. Yeah. But thank you, Dr. Nek. Yeah, Dr. Lok, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Sangam, uh, for giving very constructive comments for explore collaborations between uh, our group and Dr. Nat. Really looking forward to it. Um, so, with that, as the time is up, uh, I would like to conclude uh, today's WAM seminar series. Again, a sincere appreciation to our speaker today, Dr. Nat, also on the attendees, uh, and you know, have uh, participated attentive and uh, contributed questions to make it a very interactive session. Um, so with that, I would like to close this session and then wish everyone a pleasant day ahead and a pleasant evening for Dr. Nair. Thank you very much for, for staying with us uh, uh, also against the target. And I will, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Uh, Thank so you. Dr. Nair, is it okay if you can stay for a couple of minutes? Sure, here? sure. Um, so Professor Sangham, maybe we can use the same uh, platform. Um, Mr. Rowell, maybe you can stop recording because the uh, session is over. Thank you, Mr. Rowell. And I will also stop.